good afternoon or good evening. I want to begin with a short overview and a tribute to Kamau. Kamau's first volume writes a passage which came out in 1967, excited students at the University of the West Indies when they were introduced to it in 1969. This first volume determined the shape of the trilogy that it would form with the next two volumes, which were called Masks, which came out in 1968, and Islands, which came out in 1969. And Rites of Passage set the tone for the poet historian's concerns in all his works to come. His concerns are familiar enough. The physical and mental travails of those who were cut off from their landscape and brought as slaves to the Caribbean. The peeling away in scholarly prose and in studied verse of centuries of denigration of their ancestral land and its people and the honoring and recognizing of the very real psychic and cultural continuity between themselves and the source out of which they came. Kamau tried to carry out his epic undertaking by drawing upon the voices, the language, and the ways of being of ordinary people not yet taken out of themselves by the forces of repression, indoctrination, and by the hidden persuaders of the modern period. I worked closely with him at Mona to establish the magazine Savaku, of which we were founding editors. We were united about the need for shaping the University of the West Indies away from its identity as a college of a British university. Kamau was versatile and always interesting. He wrote a most important book about creolization. He discoursed extensively on nation language, which he demonstrated brilliantly in his poetry. And he was the prime influence in the region's eventual discovery of its potent folk and oral traditions. His work and his theories fed on the subterranean links between Africa, the Caribbean, and the African diaspora, and was especially sensitive to the music, the rhythms, the imagery, and the griefs of African-American culture as shown in the poem called Train about John Coltrane. Propped against the crowded bar, he pours into the curved and silver horn his old unhappy longing for a home. The dancers twist and turn. He leans and wishes he could burn his memories to ashes like some old notorious emperor of Rome. But no stars blazed across the sky when he was born. No wise men found his hobbel. This crowded bar where dancers twist and turn holds all the fame and recognition he will ever earn on earth or heaven. He leans against the bar 
and pours his old unhappy longing in the saxophone. This poem is not autobiography, but it is a very personal identifying with the figure of the artist and that figure's grief in the poem. In a way, Kamau is trained. Kamau and I drifted apart, but I have never wavered in my ad admiration for his passionate interest in our culture and society, his theorizing about the nature of our societies, his discovery of his native Barbados as mother, root, and symbol, and the unceasing formal experimenting in his verse. I never called him Safo Saki to his face, but that is how I thought of him. I'm just taking a snippet of Safo Saki here. We will look at Safo Saki on the screen in a short while. Safo Saki had a weary way of saying what was true. Safo Saki had a weary way of saying what was true because he knew a multitude of raven's feathers could not restrain the sky from being blue. Raven's feather, so he knew. It is consoling that like Selwyn, Walcott, and Harris, Kamau has passed into the consciousness and into the subconscious of our civilization. So my next movement deals with some very bad things that happened to Kamau in the late 1980s. Bad things which changed him certainly as a poet and very likely as a man. A savage mugging by thieves in his flat at Marley Manor. The death of his wife Zoris, Doris in 1986. And the destruction of his incomparable cultural archive by Hurricane Gilbert in 1988 helped to produce a different man and poet from the one who by 1969 had published the three volumes of what came to be called The Arrivans. It's so ironic. When I read the following lines from Prelude in Rites of Passage, I am struck by this prayer by the speaker in the poem. Grant God that this house will stand the four winds, the seasons alterations, the explorations of the worm. Grant God a clear release from thieves and robbers and from those that plot and poison while they dip into our dish. Grant to warm fires, good wives, and grateful children. It's almost as if in this, these lines from Prelude, he is anticipating what's going to happen to him in the late 1980s. And after that trauma, at least three books came out that dealt with how devastated he felt. Conversations with Nathaniel Mackey, 1991, Shah, S-H-A-R, 1992, and the harrowing and sometimes beautiful Zia Mexican Diary of 1993. 
about the death and life of his wife, Doris, tell us how devastated Kamar was by his triple trauma. And they explain the direct autobiographical strain that entered his writing after the late 1980s. In my opinion, the early poems are autobiographical too, but in a different way. One of my favorites is a poem called Clock, which is to be found in other exiles. You're not gonna see this on the screen. <clears throat> At last that night, the pounding in his dark released a flower, electricity of nerve, a blue serrated fire, the scent blooming with tears of glass rounded him. He unfolded erect, a wrecked calyx. What disasters unhinged from his growing? What impinges of pain? He stood still, still unable to move. His roots moored in water mirrored through mud, anchored him. To me, that's a very autobiographical poem about the torments that every artist goes through in his mind. We should note that in the later period that I'm just talking about in passing, in the later period, to the brilliant sunscape, soundscape in his earlier poems, Kamau began to insert a pronounced form of free visual representation on the page that he called his Sikorax video style. And when you open those later books, you see what looks like a, a mess of words and letters and dispositions of lines that are part of what he called his Sikorax video style. Not that he gives up on the sounds, but he is adding these new visuals to the page. I'm not planning to bring Kamau's later work into this conversation. I'm confining myself to the Kamau of rites of passage, masks and islands, and to some of the poems in other exiles and some of his earliest poems to be found in the magazine BIM between 1950 and 1965. I had better add that while I am making a division into early and late Kamau, I do not want to imply that there are no continuities between the two. And now we come to my good friend, Safo Saki. In 1958, the poet created the figure of Safo Saki, through whom he began to dramatize an entry into the void and to find in it ways of seeing and feeling that we cannot help imagining to be unconscious inheritances from Africa. And if you look at Safo Saki on the screen now, you can point to a number of interesting features. In the 
earlier part of the poem, which you're not seeing on the screen, but which perhaps you should get to see. So in the earlier part of the poem, we read, like sunrise, the wise old spider comes into view. Boneless, his brain in his belly. He is the perfect philosopher. Thread spinning Socrates and that other fellow who lived in his tub, who might have easily have become spiders. And then it jumps into Shamba Bolongongo, the Mahango king of the Congo, patron of arts and a preacher of peace, abolished in war, the use of dangerous weapons and drugs, instructing his soldiers carefully only to wound. Even this king, it appears, would have come to agree to the limited use of the hydrogen bomb. And then in the fourth section, the meter changes again. While we move forward into space, the deep sea, anglerfish, etc., etc., And he changes back again in section eight to deal with gossiping village women. Puffins and penguins in their flocks resemble certain loquacious market women. After the business of the mating season, these matrons gravely reassemble with murderous mumble to discuss their men. A single syllable will unsettle 10 smug husbands who thought themselves secure and with a shrug or grumble, they can strip a humble lover to the bone. And it closes by going back to Saposaki. No wonder that the little spider lives alone. And he repeats his refrain. Saposaki had a weary way of saying what was true. Saposaki had a weary way of saying what was true because he knew a multitude of raven's feathers could not restrain the sky from being blue. He examined every raven's feather so he knew. I just repeat that there is a little optimism in this poem because he knew, he had the experience. He's walked in the catacombs, a multitude of raven's feathers could not restrain the sky from being blue. What I'm about to say, are things a teacher ought to lead his students to see and to say for themselves. But in the present format, I have to say them out. Note the varieties of tones of voice. Note the orchestration of the voices. Note the different verse forms over the different blocks of the poem. Notice the spider and Nancy figure. Notice the parallel between the rays of the sun and the spider's web. Notice the sly, sly equating of philosopher with spider. Note the humor and the satire concerning gossip. And note especially Safu Saki's weary way of saying things. Sappho, weighted down by experience, 
and developing a distanced understanding of the way of the world, his weariness bespeaking the courage to endure. And if we could have seen the whole poem, you would have noticed the chopping of words into objects on the page, the retailoring of lines, and the use of space on the page that will morph into what later becomes the Sycorax video style. So to repeat, I'm making a difference between early Kamau and late Kamau, but I am not denying continuities between them. In the class of 1969, we saw in rites of passage, the motif of the journey and the journeyings that define and structure the trilogy as a whole. Ever seen a man travel more, seen more lands than this poor landless harborless speed? A whole section in rites of passage is called journeys. And the journeys begin historically with a Taino in the bushes observing and reflecting on the arrival of Christopher Columbus, which will now appear on the screen. Columbus. It's um, one of those poems that I like to look at every now and again. And I like to draw to the attention of students. Columbus from his after deck watched stars absorbed in water melt in liquid amber drifting through my summer air. Now with morning shadows lifting, beaches stretched before him, cold and clear. Birds circled, flapping flag and midsun mast. Birds harshly hawking without fear. Discovery he sailed for was so near. Columbus from his after deck Watch heights he hoped for, rocks he dreamed, rise solid from my simple water. Parrots screamed, soon he would touch our land, his charted mind's desire. This blue sky blessed the morning with his fire. But did his vision fashion as he watched the shore, the slaughter that his soldiers furthered here? Pike point and musket butt, hot splintered courage, bones cracked with bullet shot, tipped black boot in my belly, the whips uncurled desire. And after this description of the cruelties and the enslavements that followed Columbus, the poet turns sympathetically to Columbus. Columbus from his after deck saw bearded fig trees, yellow puis blazed like pollen and uh, yellow. Columbus from his after deck saw bearded fig trees, yellow puis blazed like pollen and thin waterfalls suspended in the green as his eyes climbed towards the highest ridges where our farms was hidden. Now he was sure he heard soft voices mocking in the leaves. Columbus begins to question himself. 
what did this journey mean this new world mean discovery or a return to terrors he had sailed from known before i watched him pause but of course this misgiving doesn't last very long and columbus stifles whatever humanity he has by pushing those thoughts aside then he was splashing silence crabs snapped their claws and scattered as he walked the woods or shore so that's the first of the journeys that we have in a book that is characterized by journeys and the underlying journey comes early in rites of passage the underlying journey is the departure from africa which from the way it is written foretells the return journey to africa that is at the heart of masks the second volume of the trilogy so we look for a moment at the departure on the screen and you get the desolation of the ones who are departing from their homeland it will be a long long time before we see this land again these trees again drifting inland with the sound of surf smoke rising it will be a long time before we see these farms again soft wet slow green again aburi akwamu mist rising watch now these hard men cold clear eyed like the water we ride skillful with sail and the rope and the tacker watch now these cold men bold as the water banging the bow in a sudden wild tide indifferent it seems to the battle of wind in the water for all blood mixed soon with their passion in sport in indifference in anger will create new soils new souls new ancestors will flow like this tide fixed to the star by which this ship floats the new worlds new waters new harbors the pride of our ancestors mixed with the wind and the water the flesh and the flies the whips and the fix fair of pain in this chained and welcoming port again and again in the arrivals and spectacularly in masks the return to africa is elaborated in the evocations of kinship ritual ceremony belief and hope all of this happening in masks but bravely accompanied by a chastening account of the weaknesses and self destruction that made the kingdoms vulnerable nevertheless after the experience of masks the poet returns to the island sadder wiser more respectful of himself 
and his ancestral culture, now ready at last to make a new start, watching in the Lenten morning, earths forgotten, hearts no longer bound to black and bitter ashes in the ground, now waking, making, making with their rhythms something torn and new. So the, the, the poem of departure in rites of passage almost tells us that you are going to have a poem of return. And this we do in masks. And the poem of return in masks is both a return to the true self and a return to an acknowledgement of the weaknesses that led to the kingdoms being so vulnerable. But there are other journeys in rites of passage. The poems in the first volume of the trilogy enact the passages of the peoples who came to slave their way through the flow in historical time of their denigration and dehumanization. Their histories as agricultural tools and colonized conveniences ruling out to the supposedly open sea, which turns out to be a sea of further troubles. After all they have endured, after all their struggles for emancipation and freedom and self-government, they find that the coming of independence to the islands in the 1960s was not fruition. Neither did it mean an end to uncertain journeyings. Now at independence, the island's leaders abandon the people, each blind to that harsh light and vision that had once consumed them. Once again, the supporting poor begin to catch their royal asses denuded into silence like the stones where their shacks sit, which their picks hit, where beaten spirits trapped in flesh litter the landscape with their broken homes. Kamau's focus was people of African origin, but the poems did not exclude victims of indentureship who could also claim that civilizations were built with their sweat. At the St. Augustine campus, my students of Indian origin took rites of passage as a book about themselves. They responded to the dust, to the cabin, and they identified with mammon. I knew as a teacher that I could pull everybody into the poem by starting with lines from the close of that still haunting poem. Now, slave no more. Now, harbor us no more. He forges from his progress flames new iron masters. Brilliant concrete crosses look he bears to crucify his freedom. So he must cut the cane fields of Caimanus down, of Shagaramas down, the soil too soiled with whip, with toil, with memory, with dust, replacing them with soulless, stainless, nameless stalks of steel like New York, Paris, 
London town. The ironic new world are coming. The poetic persona laments the present condition of being linked in a new clink silence of iron and looks nostalgically back at the departure from Africa. And he picks up the omens of new world dismemberment that this moment figured forth. These two movements are followed by imaginative renderings of the Uncle Tom figure who is held in contempt by the generations that came after him. To Uncle Tom, Kamau explores strategies of survival and the pain, bitterness, bravado, and the ineffectual anger of figures in exile who are symbolized by the caged leopard in islands. The dissatisfactions with life in the new world are declared systematically and with interesting stylistic and rhythmic effects in Negus in the volume Islands, which is soon to appear on the screen. <laughs> 